sorry, could I can I make a request? Um, we don't have to talk about the increased drain hood ventilation at the start, but I do have a conflict at 11 a.m. Okay, yeah, Johnny, let's see how we're doing. I okay. hope we can be kind of efficient as we work through okay. proposals today, but let's see. Um, also, if some of these earlier proponents are not here. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, all right, here we go. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today for our final mechanical tag meeting. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Krista, could we do a roll call? Caroline Traub, Chair. Here. Nancy Bernard. Here. Valerie Graber. Here. Tom Jensen. Jonathan Jones. I am here. Chris McCarthy. Chris is here. Mark Rabel. Oh, he resigned, sorry. No, Mark didn't resign. Jeff resigned. Sorry. Uh, Andrea Smith. Are you there? I think she You're just muted now. Is here. She says her mic isn't working. Ah. Brandon Stock. I'm here. Good morning. And so we do have a quorum. Excellent. Would anyone from the public like to introduce themselves? Uh, Ian Casey, Northwest Natural. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for being here. Mike Moore, Stater LLC, representing Brown Newtown. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. All righty. So next up is to review and approve the agenda. I think the meeting minutes are not available, so that was the one item we will skip today. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to amend or to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Thanks, Jonathan. Sorry, I'll second. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Any further discussion? Although, I, would, I would be willing to move mine um, past the range hood ventilation proposal uh, due to the gentleman's restriction on time. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, yeah, let's see how we're doing. And if we want to move that one to the end, um, if we're feeling crunched, we can do that. Appreciate that. Do we need that in the motion to approve the agenda? I, I missed the first 30 seconds of the meeting yeah no worries i think um the johnny who's representing mark today on the increased range of ventilation just has a, a conflict starting at 11 a.m so we can go ahead and move jonathan the um mike libliner's proposal to the end i think that probably makes sense just to make sure we don't run out of time there thank you for that suggestion so let's see jonathan you are amending your motion to move Proposal nine and eight to the last item. Yes, I am making them that proposal. Great. Thank you. And Nancy, I think you seconded. Is that all right with you? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. I was voting aye. Sorry. I was being texted. That's the problem when you have two screens. Okay. All right. So um, quick recap for everyone. Um, as we've said before, we received a total of 17 proposals. Um, we had the one editorial one, so it's really just 16 
Over the past three tag meetings, we have discussed all of these, some of them multiple times. We've moved forward either as submitted or as modified 10 of them. So we have six items remaining. Those are the ones on the agenda for today. Um, revisions for these proposals were either posted last week or were received yesterday. So all of those are posted with the meeting materials for today's meeting. Um, today is our last mechanical tag meeting. So just as a reminder, the tag has great flexibility in how proposals are addressed. You can move to approve them as submitted, you can move to approve them as modified, or you can move to disapprove them. Uh, because this is our last meeting, we don't have the option to table items. So um, if items aren't ready, um, they likely need to be disapproved. Um, so I hope everyone's warmed up and ready to make some motions today. Um, and then as a reminder, just overall process, any proposals that are moved forward by the TAG will go to the MVE committee, likely sometime the week of June 13th, and then to the council for the June 17th meeting. So if you do discover any editorial items or correlation things um, to anything that we approve to move forward, please reach out so we can address those items at the MVE meeting. Um, and then after the June 17th meeting, all of these proposals will be available for public comment over the summer. So that will be another opportunity for input, um, corrections, correlation items. So for today, uh, just hoping the proponent can reintroduce the proposal to refresh us all on purpose, highlight concerns and questions that were raised last time, and how those have been addressed. So any questions on anything um, about process before we dive in? Excellent. So today we are starting with proposal 75 about um, fire barriers and fire partitions. I believe, Eric, this is your proposal, so the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we reviewed this one, I think, at the first meeting and then, or way back when, and uh, we didn't get to it last week. So um, I did work with Valerie a little offline, like we had talked about. Um, in reviewing this further, I noticed that the the current versions online for 2021 IBC and 2020 IMC have slightly different wording between these two. Um, these should really be mirrored sections. I use the IMC version of this. Um, and so for, for my uh, modifications, as we did discuss the first meeting, um, there was some 2021 changes in the code uh, to, to address what I was trying to address, which was only uh, done for the fire barriers section of the code, not the fire partitions. So I have some minor clarifications in the fire barrier portion that's proposed further down. And then I'm gonna, I'm proposing to also add this to the fire partitions section to have similar language uh, for both of those um, sections of the code. Uh, but at some point, yeah, I guess we need to decide if we're going to go with the IMC language and then correlate that back to the IBC. So that's something to talk about as part of this process. Um, so why don't we look at the language I used on the next page and then we'll go from there. Um, so again, I, my original proposal was more extensive to this section, so I'm up for the fire barrier section. So I'm recommending just the changes that are showing in blue uh, to have a little bit broader language than just say uh, diffuser to say diffuser, grill, or register to re reflect how it's described in chapter six of the me mechanical code. Um, and, uh, and then I also, was recommending a clarification that the unit could be located outdoors. So essentially, uh, this now has a clearer language for how, uh, what is the fully ducted system and, and how that is treated. It does allow for the flex connection at the unit. And then it does, um, it does allow for the final connection to the diffuser to have uh, the, the non-metal flexible air connector. So that really clarifies what I was trying to clarify in my 
disposal for the fire barriers. So then in, in fire partitions, I don't know why they chose uh, to only propose this for the fire barrier section, but I'm proposing uh, making these same clarifications for the, the fire partition section of the code. So adding the words fully ducted uh, to mimic what they did above and then to provide the same clarifications for uh, the non-metal connections uh, at the, the units. Um, and then item 4.2, I did add a sentence um, saying where the fully ducted system um, you know, is passing through a corridor fire partition uh, that it that it's essentially continuous without openings to the corridor. Just to clarify that, you're you're essentially using the the fully ducted metal system to pass through the corridor without openings. Um, so that it, that last sentence there is an added sentence for uh, the fire partitions, which are common for corridor uh, rated corridor construction and certain occupancy types. Um, at the end of this proposal, I did copy in the uh, the, IE, the ICC change that was proposed and its basis if people uh, want to review that or to review that. So that language is in here. Um, and there's not really an explanation in there as to why it was only uh, proposed for fire barriers and, and not for the fire partitions. But So that's my proposed. Uh, changes if there's any questions or comments um well thanks Eric. i had one question which was um in the fire barriers section krista if you go to yeah exception three right there in front of you the very last sentence before 3.1 and 3.2 uh flexible air connection shall be permitted in a fully ducted system limited to the following installations. I think that sentence, Eric, needs to be copied and also put down below. Oh, did I miss copying that one? Okay. Um, so then- Yeah, you're right, okay. Good catch. Um, and then that very last sentence added in 4.2, does it need just like a comma or something? So where the fully ducted HVAC system metal ductwork penetrates a corridor fire partition, the ductwork shall be continuous without openings to the corridor, comma, to a mechanical room, comma, or to a shaft enclosure. Is that the intent? Out openings. Maybe it'd be better to say out openings in the corridor or I don't. So yeah, I was just proposing a comma, Krista, after the word corridor in that last sentence. Yeah, you're right, you need some help. Um, oh, sorry, next corridor. There's a corridor like six words from the end or something. Yeah, and then a comma after the word room and then um, or, or yeah, two, or, or two, two a, a two yeah. enclosure. Yeah, that probably one. Um, cool. And then down below, Eric, where you added that extra stuff, I sent an email to that committee to ask them that question of why this language was not included for fire partitions. So I haven't heard anything back, but that would be interesting to know. I think you raised that question. Um, Mike. Thank you. I'm not very familiar with this section, but I'm just wondering how it applies to dwelling units. Um, and maybe I just missed the introductory text here to address this, but like, for example, if this is meant to apply to dwelling units as well, then are we concerned about room or is it within the dwelling unit? Anywhere else within the dwelling unit is okay? So dwelling units are typically separated with fire partitions, correct? And then the 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 residential corridor, those are typically fire partitions also. So right. so you are allowed to penetrate the demising wall between 
uh, dwelling units, and you have several options of how you, how you do that. Um, you know, the most common op, yeah. So, so as, so yes, that, that would be an option to use this exception. As long as you had a continuous, fully continuous metal duct, you could penetrate that and provide, you know, provide a open duct between that. You're already allowed to do that with the, the special sleeve option in item three above, um, or you could provide, you know, fire dampers if you chose, correct? Okay, thanks, Eric. Okay, hey, any other comments or questions for Eric on this one? All right, seeing none. Um, looking for a motion. I make a motion to pass this change as written. I'll Thank second. You. Thank you, Nancy. Any further discussion? That's actually as modified, but. As modified, sorry. Second. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, hearing none, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right, great. So I think next up is the proposal about filtration. And so Mike, I think you're in the hot seat to catch us up on what changes you made and why. Yep, thank you. Good morning. Um, all right, so our travels have been when this was first presented, uh, this proposal was looking to delete the recirculation exception in 605.5. Uh, input from the tag suggested that there should be a specific list of equipment uh, that should have an exception. And this proved out to be quite difficult to do in clear and effective code language. Uh, there was some additional input from the tag members. Uh, there was some interest in how California has incorporated MERV 13 filtration into their code. And so now um, I counted up this morning. We had seven rounds of review with Eric uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, this proposal now contains in 605.1 uh, some clearer language on the filtered air. And it also borrows language or it brings the language from 605.4 on cooling into this section. So the language on filtration being upstream of any heating or cooling is now within 605.1. Uh, 605.4 lists out the MERV level of uh, filtration for specific occupancies and for how we tried to clean up the um, fan coils were proving the most difficult. Fan coils are included in the unducted air handlers. And then there's uh, last, there's just uh, a few suggested edits to the language that was previously approved by the tag in 605.5. Uh, the blue is language that the tag uh, previously approved and the red is some proposed new edits. So that's the quick summary. Great, thank you, Mike. Open the floor for any questions or comments. Um, Eric, go ahead. Um, a couple editorial things still. Um, so in the first section, 605.1, uh, where it says, and all outdoor air supplied to occupiable space, I think that needs to say spaces probably in the second sentence there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, is it clear, my, my question, is it clear that 605.4 would apply to ERVs or is that clear to folks? Is that, will, pe will people be calling an ERV a, a ducted air handler, I guess, or do we need to get more specific was the only other thought I had this morning, Mike, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, 
for sharing these revisions. So my question is kind of similar to Eric's there, just trying to understand like for a dwelling unit, for example, that would be a an R2, um, you've got this particulate matter removal requirement in 605.4 um, that presumably would uh, apply to the heating and cooling system, air handlers. Um, and then it doesn't seem like that would apply to outdoor air uh, ventilation systems, um, which would fall under 605.5 um, and only apply if you've got greater than 500 CFM require, uh, required or provided, sorry, through the system and it would not apply to supply um, systems either. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to that and what your intention is. I, your summary, Mike, was uh, exactly what I'm is what I think is, is being proposed here. To, uh, um, and for yes, that uh, say a DOAS system, um, since it does not have specific heat or cooling within it, uh, falls into that. It you know, would fall into six hundred five point five outdoor air. Um, the only time, you know, and then then if it was above 500 CFM, then it would, that 605.5 would apply to that, that type of residential system, if that answers it. Okay, thank you. Valerie. So in 605.1, you say provided with an approved air filter. Are you saying 605.4 is the approved air filter? And yes. Okay. And you're requiring a MERV 13 in our occupancies and all these other listed that you have. Then you go down to outdoor air 605.5 should be provided in 500 CFMs or more. So that really only includes group two, which is FHSNU, because all the other ones actually already have to have it. So that's kind of confusing. Um, so really 605.5 is only gonna direct you to the group two MERV-8 filters. And then Eric, as you said, the air handlers and energy recovery is spelled out in 605.5, but not above. But I think you're giving a, a long enough laundry list up there of equipment that Tell you you need a uh, filter than anything coming into the space from outside there. It's just, uh, I don't know if you actually need 605.5, if really you're only pointing at F, H, S, and U. Those were just my takes on reading that. Well, yeah, my, you... my, go ahead, Eric. You would need it to pick up the ERVs in an office, in a, say an office decided to do unducted air handlers and fan coil units. They could go down to MER 4 right now in the whole office area with unducted fan coils. And then, but their ERV, if they had a central ERV serving the floor, would still be required to have MER 13. So I'm the main, the, Maybe we need in 605.1 a, a pointer to 605.4. So at the end of the second sentence, which air through which air is supplied in accordance with 605.4 or something like that, the end of the second sentence. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're saying that you want those filters and then you say approved filters, you're leaving it up to the jurisdiction and, or who knows, that might not be an approved filter to them. So you actually have to say shall be provided and where. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. I mean, okay. that was in uh, last week's when we ended, ended the meeting last week, but I, I thought that and I, I, I do agree with your point. Um, it was in there last week and then I was like, okay, well, I think 605.4 spells it all out but if we need the pointer to come back in 6051 i think that's a good recommendation yeah because it does leave it open the code needs to say shall provide and give give something that is to you know 
spells it out what you should provide. Yeah, and italicized okay. approve just because that was italicized in the online uh, IMC okay. for Washington. So it's, it's, that's my assumption that it has a definition somewhere, but it, it's not going to say what, what 605.4 says. So is Mike the, the comment then at the end of that first sentence, right where you are, does it need to say with approved air filters per 605.4 or in accordance with 605.4? Yes, and I think Chris, it Chris might is like, which is better for me to five dot four and six oh five dot five just to and provide a pointer to both. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, I think that's probably the best place to put it. I also just in the past couple of comments, I thought I heard both sides of whether the intent here was that ERVs and DOAS units who would meet the requirements, so a group um, B or R, so MERV 13 item one is the intent that those are also requiring MERV 13. I think additional clarity could be added there. I think, well, the intent is that, well, as it's written, and if it, if it provides heating or cooling, then it has, it's per 605.4, a DOAS system is going to fall into 605.5 and, and asking for the capability. Okay, so as written right now, the intent is that ERVs and DOAS units that do not have heating or cooling coils are only subject to 605.5. That's, yes. And what is the logic there? Staying with Part of it is it's just, it's just um, aligning with currently what we have in 605.5, and that's been approved by the TAG. Not not to try to deviate from that as much. Um, that was a that was a new step added uh, from City of Seattle language. Um, I'm all for additional MERV 13 filtration, but um, I just felt that this was providing a good good balance. Is it a heat exchanger uh, the same thing as an energy recovery unit? In fact, you know, you're exchanging the heat. Yeah, it could have a wetted surface if it's a a heat exchanger that has sensible only heat recovery and doesn't allow latent, so it could condense there. Um, Mike, you, I guess, Valerie, you're just raising the point that it's still a little bit unclear. If you have an energy recovery device of some sort, is the intent that this applies to that or not? Um, Mike, go ahead. You wrote something in the chat. Yeah, thank you. I was just thinking about um, you know systems that provide outdoor air, like a DOAS or or some other type of supply system that does not have energy recovery. I presume that we would still want those to comply with six hundred five five. It's not just that it has energy recovery that would uh, that would make us concerned about filtering the outdoor air. It's that we've got outdoor air being introduced at a very high CFM rate, or let's say moderate CFM rate, whatever. Um, so Mike, would would that language, would you be okay with the, the change there? Air, air handlers and ventilation systems instead of an energy recovery ventilators that provide outdoor air? I think it helps provide clarity that it's, I'm gonna say it's addresses more, do it, 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 it's a better job of addressing DOAS systems. Um, I'm trying to just decide, think if it, is there still a, any ambiguity between HRVs or ERVs? I mean, you know, where, they, where, where do they still the, fall into? Yeah, those would be ventilation systems mm -hmm. in, in my mind, at least. You don't think so, Eric? Do you have concerns there? Sorry, I was, I'm just shaking my head at trying to figure out how to untangle this. Okay. 
So <laughs> every time I look at this, I can't figure out how to make it clear. So you're saying if the first sentence said heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems shall be provided with approved filters meeting the requirements of those two sections. And filters shall be installed. Yeah, it was about maybe just focusing on that one real quick. Mike, your comment was in 605.5, just saying air handlers and ventilation systems in lieu of energy recovery ventilators, just to make it a bit broader. Yeah, that... I got you. Okay. Right. Is that a friendly amendment to you, Mike Fowler? Yes. Okay. So then that is in there. And then Eric, you're back up at 605.1. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get 605.1 to clearly point to 605.4 and 605.5. So if it said heating, air conditioning, and ventilation system shall be provided with approved filters. Yes, now that we've added ventilation systems to 605.5, I was, had a similar thought, Eric. Should we use air handlers and ventilation systems throughout to use the same terminology like 605.4 versus air handlers, 605.5 has air handlers and ventilation systems? Yeah, we can just do that. Yeah. I'll be provided with the proof feeder meeting. So the 605.1 would just say air handlers and ventilation systems. And then shall be provided with approved air filters meeting 6054 and 6055. And then in the next sentence, I'm wondering if it becomes clear if it filters shall be installed such that all recirculated air and all outdoor air supplied to occupiable spaces is filtered, period. And then the last sentence, filters shall be upstream from any heat exchanger or coil. I don't know if breaking that into two separate sentences is helpful or not. It's an interesting distinction. Um, you could have an ERV, for example, that, uh, that dumps outdoor air into a dwelling unit. And, um, and as long as it's not integrated with the air handler, as long as the air handler had a MERV 13 filter, um, with it, that outdoor air would be filtered prior to um, in being introduced into the heat exchanger or coil. So if you broke it up as proposed, there might be some confusion about whether you would have to do double filtration in that case and filter the outdoor air for your separate dedicated system and then also filter the recirculated air. Um, or if you just need to filter it before it goes through the uh, heating and cooling air handling. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, my other thought is, yeah, in the middle of the second sentence, you could say filter shall be installed such that all recirculated air is filtered per 605.4 and all outdoor air is filtered per 605.5. That's, that's helpful, I think. And then not, not say it there. So all recirculated air shall install. Filter shall be on such that all recirculated air is. We don't shall need installed again, right? Shall, shall be filtered. filtered. Shall be filtered per, <laughs> filtered in accordance with. Uh, 
and all outdoor air. Now, I don't know if you need the supplied to occupiable spaces because we say that in. We say that in both of those sections then already. Yeah, and it got added in the MERV 13 and 8s. I think you could get rid of the supply to all occupiable spaces part because that's already covered below and say all outdoor air shall be filtered in accordance with 605.5 with the car. And then hit, then do period, like airline was recommending, and then start a new sentence. <laughs> period. Then I think it filters shall be upstream. Yeah, filters shall be. I don't know, I'm gonna say, I'll say I feel like it's getting away from the direction of where this was trying to go um, in terms of heated or cooling air, if that system, because uh, it's taken away, if outdoor air is feeding that heating or cooling system, but that no longer has to be the MERV 13 filters. Yeah, it was set up to be um, heating and cooling air, recirculated air would be 605.4 and a DOAS system would be 605.5 with the capability. And so like these recent edits have taken away any outdoor air supplied to a heating or cooling system. Has lost the MERV 13 piece as a requirement, it's only the capability. I guess, Mike, I'm still missing the boat on why that distinction. Why are you not providing MERV 13 for DOAS and ERVs? I guess you're. I guess I was trying. I was, I was trying to retain 605.5. I was trying to retain it. I, mean, I guess and part of me thinks that, that that I mean it's been approved, but it, I would like to see all air handling systems, whether it's DOAS or heated or cooled, uh, you know, provide the level of filtration that is within 605.4. So I guess part of me is saying that, I don't know, I don't know if the 605.5 is, is necessary. Cause that would, that would, cause there, we're trying to fissure it out into two different lo locations. Um, I was trying to retain what was Included newly into the code is 6055, is trying to retain that. But um, and then in retaining that, it would the focus would be on DOAS systems for that 605.5, um, everything else. But um, yeah, I guess in my ideal world, in my own head, that 605.4 is really what I'm proposing. And you know, an option would be to delete completely delete 605.5. And you could drop in uh, of in 605.4, uh, the 500 CFM, if that was a threshold you wanted to maintain. Yeah, I mean, if you went that route, I think the function of 605.5 is still requiring space for MERV 13 for group F, H, S, and U, which could be a benefit in a smoke event. Uh, Valerie. You could remove 605.5 and just make an exception under 605.4 for systems um, less than 500 CFMs. Say they don't need a MERV 
13, if they were less than 500 CFMs, then that would get your our occupancies that have ERVs that are have less than 500 CFMs, and they would they could get a MERV eight instead. But instead of making that a code section, make put an exception for for that threshold. What do you think about that, Mike, Valerie? Uh, I think what Valerie summarized is what I, is essentially what I was trying to say. Yeah, I think that, that does capture it. Which was striking 605.5 and then- And then providing the exception that systems under 500 CFM. Yeah, if we said in items one and two, ducted air handlers and ventilation systems, and then the exception would give you mm -hmm. I'm just making an exception for the small CFMs. Mm -hmm. And does the exception only apply to items one and two? Or does it apply to all three? I think it could apply to all three. Okay. Because essentially the number four to the number fours aren't doing anything from a health standpoint. But. I am assuming that you don't want to uh, exclude them from any filtration, though. What correct? What minimum do you want to uh, specify? Well, it's going to be MERV eight for a correlation. The small systems have to be MERV eight for the residential chapter four section. So I think yeah, systems under five hundred CFM would need MERV-8 unless they're the inducted again. So, so you could say uh, air ducted air handlers and, and ventilation systems under 500 CFM. Shall so have a minimum. Of MERV-8. Oh, yeah. Does it make sense to have this be an exception or should it just be a number four that MERV-8 would be required for ducted air handlers and ventilation systems under 500 CFM? Because up above it, it says particular matter air filters or air cleaners shall have a minimum efficiency reporting value of not less than the following. So instead of being an exception, you could just add it as, as add MERVIT as a requirement for ducted air handlers and ventilation systems under 500 CFM. I think it works better as an exception. <laughs> yeah, I think that would work, Chris, if we had items one and two say over 500 CFM, and then each of the items had an air threshold. Um, I, think, I think this works. So. You're leaving out the 500 CFM systems though. You say under 500 and you say over 500, but what about if it's 500? <laughs> Okay. Not less than. <laughs> Not less than. Okay. So I think, uh, Krista, if you delete that over 500 CFM you just typed, I think we can. Uh, I think we can delete that, right? Because we're going to 
leave it as an exception. Exceptions easier, I think. Yeah. So ducted air handlers and ventilation systems. 500 CFM or less. Yeah. And the exception. Um, so the exception would read ducted air handlers and ventilation systems. 500 CFM or less. Okay, so this change, Mike, just so I'm clear now includes, um, or, or we need to edit 605.1 if you want it to include DOAS and ERV systems. So now it is all inclusive of any ventilation system. It is just um, not applicable to the smaller systems is the goal. Correct, yes. So yeah, now we can. I guess if that's the goal, I'm just questioning, do we need this language about recirculated air and outdoor air if we've already said air handlers and ventilation systems? Are you trying to? So I think it makes it clear that it, that's that both are included. I mean, basically, when you're recirculating, you need to bring it back to a point where it's going through a filter. So then the question just becomes on an ERV on the return side, what is your minimum filter? So. so a question here, yeah, for the, so let's say you have an ERV that's, um, that's integrated with an air handler. Um, this, the way that 6051 is written right now, you'd have to put your, let's say it's a group R occupancy and it's uh, 501 CFM. So in that case, you would have to put your MERV 13 filter um, upstream of the ERV heat exchanger um, or coil, I guess is what it says. I'm just going to, my concern here is that you might have to double filter the um, the air. So it, you might have to filter it before you go through the ERV heat exchanger and then put another MERV 13 filter on the, uh, uh, before you go through the air handler, which isn't really necessary. As long as you're filtering the outdoor air once prior to introducing it, you should be good to go. So you might have like a MERV um, three filter or something like that, or an unrated filter ahead of the heat exchanger for the ERV. Um, and then you've got uh, your, your MERV 13 filter uh, downstream of that, but before you get to the cooling coil. That makes sense. So in that case, you're saving energy because you're not, um, you don't have static pressure losses associated with two MERV 13 filters, and you're still providing the minimum protection required for the occupants. So I just wanted to make sure that we can still do that with this language is written. Yeah, great comment, Mike. Just making it clear that the filter, if you have multiple heat exchangers or multiple coils, that the filter is upstream of all of those, but there only need be one. Is that what you're getting after? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I so, did remember seeing in California, I thought they they had a piece of language that I think is addressing what Mike just commented on. Um, and I was trying to find where I bookmarked that. Okay, while you're looking for that, um, Austin, go ahead. Yeah, just to talk to that a little bit. 
the the 500 CFM is going to limit most, you know, small residential units. So we're not going to see a scenario like this where the ERV is going to require a, that MERV 13 or the fan coil. So this that 500 CFM is really getting into larger spaces where there's going to be lots of outside air and lots of recirculated air through the fan coil. Uh, and so there's two different types of filtration we're trying to achieve outside air filtration for smoke and all other outside air contaminants um, and the you know potential contamination in inside the space so having two filtration two 13 13 filtration is a much bigger benefit on these larger systems so I would say it's worth not taking it's worth not having that clarification to have only one filter that's a MERV 13. Thanks, Austin. Um, Mike Moore, any thoughts about that? Well, as long as you're filtering that outdoor air before you're introducing it to the space, then I think you should be good to go. The California study wasn't based on, on cost effectiveness and, uh, and the filtration requirements wasn't based on double filtration of the outdoor air, it was just based on the assumption of single filtration. Um, so I think that as long as you're getting one pass through a MERV 13 before you're introducing it, you're, um, you're meeting the intent there. And then of course, it, as that air handler goes, it's gonna be filtered again and again and again. Um, once it's recirculated. So I think that, you know, single filtration prior to introduction in the occupiable space and um, an upstream of any uh, cooling coil would be, the, um, would be the way to go. But yeah, I just wouldn't wanna put restrictions on systems that we might not be imagining right now. Um, it's not necessary as long as the occupants are still being protected. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I guess looking back at 6051, the first sentence seems straightforward. The second sentence, um, Krista, do we need to unstrike out the is filtered. So filter shall be installed such that all recirculated air and all outdoor air is filtered. Yeah, that guy. Um, upstream from any heater or coil and upstream of all cooling coils or other devices with wetted services through which air is supplied. Um, okay, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I guess what I'm going back to my question is, do we need an exception for energy recovery unit re relief and exhaust air that's coming back with that is the intent to provide MERV 13 filtration on the return side of the ERV. As I currently read this, that's what you'd have to do in a group R occupancy. So because you have to have a filter that's in accordance with 605.4. The ERV is serving an occupiable space. It's a ventilation system. And I have to have a filter upstream of the heat exchanger on the return, on the relief slash exhaust side. So now I need to provide more 13 filtration on that if I'm more than 500 CFM. <laughs> I don't know if there's a lot of units. Well, I mean, I guess it's possible on a custom air handler or something, but you know, if you have a fixed plate heat exchanger that has no cross contamination potential, do you really need a MERV 13 filter on the exhaust? So. so we could add an exception too for ventilation system. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to, I could come up with some language, I guess. I'll work on it. 
I'm sorry, Eric, you're just talking about not having to filter the exhaust airstream that is leaving. Yeah. yeah if it's exhausting and leaving I'm, and not being reintroduced, it doesn't seem like that needs to be filtered at all. It's not the intent. Well, by code it does because it's it's upstream of a heat exchanger. So because and is that Eric, is that a byproduct of the deletion of supplied to occupiable space? Well, I mean, there's different types of heat exchanger. You know, a wheel is going to have some leakage, right? And it's allowed to have up to 10 percent leakage per mm -hmm. code. Now, most wheels have under one percent leakage, mm -hmm. um, but it's still required to have a, a filter upstream of it to protect the wheel. The and total enthalpy wheel. If you have a, you know, if you have a uh, a sensible and latent core, it's going to have some leakage between the two airstreams, right? And that temp leakage again is allowed to be up to ten percent for a code. Um, anyways, so yeah, typically the air coming back is filtered, has to be filtered to protect the energy recovery, the heat exchanger, and. Uh, but yeah, do we only need a MERV six or filter there, or what do we want? So, Carolyn will probably uh, mention it, but I was just reading Mike Moore's comment in the chat and that uh, moving it to say uh, filtration prior to introduction to occupiable space. I think that that in first read it sounds like that might address what you're talking about, Eric. Well, but we're losing the requirement we had before for MERV six coming back, right? Yeah, there's probably a better way to write that. I'm trying to think of it right now, Eric, where you like maybe an exception where MERV six filters provided upstream of a heat exchanger. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll work on all sentence here. Okay, come back to me. <laughs> okay, so we have this issue about minimum filtration requirements for the exhaust airstream upstream of heat exchangers that Eric is noodling on. Are there, as folks read this one more time, stare at it, uh, is anything else unresolved or unclear? Thank you, Krista. Okay. Um, so I guess then if we're gonna write another exception to 605.1, we already have that existing exception. So Krista, should we say exceptions and then the cooling coils were designed becomes item one. And then um, the, this other exception, is for, I guess, <laughs> TBD. I don't know if we want to come back to this and after the next proposal or? Sure, well, Eric, just to, to shoot it around then, it would be um, exhaust, air, or filtration, I guess it's exhaust or relief air upstream of a heat exchanger shall have a minimum of MERB six. Yeah, I guess that works. Yeah. Um, from a heat exchanger shall have a minimum MERB six. Well, have a filter not less than MERV six. Shall have a filter not less than MERV six. I don't, should it be there or should it be in the exceptions under under 605.4 where we're talking about MERV ratings? Yeah, that's a great point. <clears throat> I think we move it down. Sorry, Krista.
Okay. And then I think, Krista, if we just delete the TBD and capitalize the exhaust. Okay. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I think as I mentioned at the outset here, if there are other editorial items or um, minor technical things, those can be addressed at the upcoming MBE community meeting um, or during the public comment period. Um, Eric, go ahead. Can we add two more words to that exception? Heat exchanger or coil could be a run around loop. So. Sure. How does that work with number three? Is that Trump number three? You're saying the MER four unducted air handlers? They're not going to have exhaust or relief air coming back to them. So I'm just unducted recirculating in the space. Okay. All right. Any final thoughts or comments for Mike? So I guess when we pass this, it, this would remove Austin's proposal essentially, or do we, does the motion need to contain information around that? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Eric. I think the motion should, well, I guess it's a question for Austin because I think, right, 605.5, if it were to exist, could have um, um, an impact on those occupancies that currently only require MERV-8, and it would require those occupancies to then also provide space for MERV-13. Um, but, so I think Austin's options are, uh, uh, uh. Are, are withdrawing his proposal or sending it through in case this proposal doesn't pass um, through the process. I don't we get into this on the energy code side more where if something gets contentious that we want two proposals going through this, the, the system. So this could, Austin's proposal could be contingent on this getting passed in full or, or whatnot. So. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy with that. I would, you know. <clears throat> Like my proposal go through, it's basically the first thing go through. Uh, I think this is a, a better, you know, overall proposal, and I'd like it if it goes through. I I'll drop mine for sure. Okay, thanks, Austin. Um, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, this might reduce some of the text. Uh, it could be redundant there in six hundred five point one. If you scroll up just a little bit there, Krista, um, there's that text. It's in bold there that an upstream of all cooling coils or other devices with wetted surfaces through which air is supplied. Is that covered by any heat exchanger or coil? That phrase above uh, prior to it, because we're talking about a cooling coil right after we're talking about a coil. So presumably cooling coils would fit underneath the coil reference. And I'm not sure of other wetted surfaces through which air is supplied. Um, if we're missing something, if we just keep it at any heat exchanger or coil. Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. Any objections to deleting that sentence, which seems to be a subset of coil 
Is that really needed? I think is the question. And the sentence originally came from 62.1 and was in the 605.4. So yeah, I think it can be removed if, if we could just stay with the general language or coil. Mike Fowler, is that amenable to you? I agree. Yes. Okay. okay so what am I removing? I think you're removing that and 605.1. Um, after the word, yeah, or coiled, yep. the entire rest of that sentence. Yep. And I guess a similar question, that exception about sensible cooling coils. you know, was seemingly tied to that language in the sense that we just deleted. And that exception comes directly from 62.1. I think we should keep it. If we're gonna keep the language, general language of bulk coil. Okay, uh, Mike, go ahead. Mike Moore? Uh, yeah, the exceptions as well. Do Krista, do we need to show those as new text underlined 6054 exceptions? I was just showing it in simple markup so you didn't have all the. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the remaining underline <laughs> is for me doing it word and underlining and not track changes. That's <laughs> my error, not Christus. All right. Got it. Okay, give everybody another minute to reread here. Okay, don't see any hands up. Oh, Nancy, go ahead. Um. I just want to express my appreciation for all this work. I think this is really important to public health. And um, I um, expect my agency to support the um, implementation since this has been um, well documented in the last few years, the need for this. So I want to thank you all. I'm, and I'll move approval if we're ready. I don't want to cut short the words. Yeah, I think your motion would be to approve as shown on the screen yes. with, with the, um, the also the notion that if this passes through the CR 102 and CR 103, that Austin's proposal would get removed. I don't know what the number of that proposal is off the top of my head. I can grab it. Let's see. Uh, let's see, proposal 86. If that is the appropriate wording, I so move. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? I second the motion. Thanks, Valerie. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I only heard two ayes there. Anybody else an aye? All right, uh, any opposed, please say nay. Okay, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote um, just so we can make sure to capture this, Krista, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Uh, Nancy. Aye. Valerie. Aye. Jonathan. 
Hi, sorry, it's been a tough one for me to decide. Thank you. Chris? Hi. Andrea? No. Brandon? I'm going to stay on this one. I'd, I'd like more time to review it, but if, if we get a quorum, then that's fine. Motion carried four to one with one abstention. Great. Thank you all. And um, sorry for a minute. Is there a, a number I should use when I tell my um, agency about this? In terms of which proposal number it is? Mm -hmm. I think it's 98. Yes. Thank you. Do we get a little break? Yes, we can take a quick break. It is 10, 12. Um, let's take a five minute break and resume at 10, 17. So we are now with our revised agenda on to proposals 63 and 62 for increased range hood ventilation. And I think in lieu of Mark, we have Johnny here today. So Johnny, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, yeah, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so I worked with a number of folks. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who um, helped work on this. A lot of thoughtful comments. Um, I added in some definitions and um, actually went through pretty much <laughs> all relevant portions of the mechanical and residential code um, that are um, interact with either range hoods or with um, domestic cooking ranges, as well as local exhaust for kitchens. Um, I made some of the changes here are actually just editorial changes to make corrections because of errors I found in the code, and others are um, specific, so uh, specific to the proposals themselves. So um, I added a definition to enclosed kitchens based off of ASHRAE 62.2. Um, this is mostly because of a change that we made to the table um, that requires kitchen ventilation for enclosed versus non-enclosed kitchens. This aligns closer with what California is doing. Um, and then um, here, in, uh, I made a small change, um, this is an editorial change to uh, minimum ventilation rates, uh, note K, um, that is just the, the wrong table was being pointed to that table, I'm pretty sure didn't exist in the code. Um, so I pointed to the correct table for 403.4.6.1. Um, we just kind of made it a little bit more clear that this is a specific for spaces other than kitchens and added in um, a few extra control, sensor, uh, control um, options. Um, for 403.4.6.3, um, we just kind of broadened the language a little bit. Instead of saying intermittent, 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 we just said local exhaust systems that are not a component of local house ventilation are exempt from balanced airflow. We added timer controls to 403.4.7. Um, so here's kind of getting more into the meat of it. Uh, table 403.4.7. We are um, for open kitchens. Um, we are not permitting continuous exhaust systems. Um, it doesn't particularly make sense for an open kitchen because an open kitchen is open to, to the rest of the common spaces of the home and um, won't effectively ventilate the space to get rid of the pollutants. Um, and then based on for enclosed kitchens, if the continuous ventilation rates are um, chosen, then uh, it's based off of five air changes based on kitchen volume, which is defined as what an enclosed kitchen is according to the definition um, above from ASHRAE 62.2. .2. 
and then we have both intermittent for both open and closed kitchens or pointing to section um, 403.7.3, uh, which is below. Uh, so 403.7.2, um, can you scroll down? Yeah, here um, we are basically just adding in the sound requirements to 403.7.2 here. Um, instead of in the separate section, because this is already kind of um, putting in comments for, or uh, putting in requirements for local exhaust streams. And this is for intermittent local exhaust systems serving kitchens, which is basically range hoods or downdraft hoods. We kind of broaden the language so it isn't just specific to range hoods, since there are other kinds of local exhaust um, that answered one of the concerns, I believe, um, that Valerie had. And then um, we added in some specific language around uh, where the um, duct work should be. And yeah, and then for the actual ex exhaust requirements, we simplified the table for 3.7.3 based off of concerns we heard. So it is no longer based off square footage. Now it's just based off of fuel type, um, so it's either combustion range or electric range, and we simplified it to 250 CFM and 160 CFM versus uh, before we had it up to 280 on the combustion side, and it was based off square footage. Um, we think this simplification would uh, make it easier for it to be enforced. And then I worked with folks on the field verification and diagnostic for uh, the different exhaust systems according to 403.4.7.3.1. Um, and um, if you can scroll down. We just have some um, information here. Here, If uh, an exhaust system ends up requiring makeup error, that um, I know Eric had a lot of concerns that if it, if it doesn't require makeup error, that there could be some sort of negative uh, negative pressure. So we're saying that the testing must occur with an open window. And um, we didn't really change the makeup air requirements. Uh, originally, I, I changed it and lowered it, but um, I heard concerns that lowering the makeup air from 400 CFM to like 300 or 200 would increase the cost too much for um, these intermittent range hoods, and if it was lowered to 200, it would actually unfairly um, impact um, specifically the combustion range stoves. It would increase the cost significantly. Um, so keeping it at 400 currently. Um, scroll down. I think we're exempting um, intermittent kitchen exhaust from pressure equalization, continue to scroll down. I think this is just a, about location of the exhaust grill. Um, I think that's it on this proposal. Okay, thanks. I know I just kind of blew through that pretty fast. So if anybody has questions on this. The other proposal, um, should we go over the other proposal or just answer questions on that first one? Um, maybe why don't you go over this one as well? And then if there's similar it's, issues, it's very similar. Yeah, it's similar issues, similar changes, just a lot of editorial changes in this um, definition of an enclosed kitchen again, adding local exhaust, um, kind of for the exhaust discharge we're pointing for an enclosed kitchen, it's pointing for just the table. Um, So mostly, yeah, same thing. We're kind of broadening the language instead of just having a bunch of different intermittent, we're just saying local exhaust, um, adding in the timer controls again, editorial change on the intermittent off operation, and then the same table with the same requirements as the other one um, for sound and for location of the duct work. And then um, same. Again, just referencing different tables and sections. 
Um, and then I don't think that this had anything past this point. Okay. And uh, yeah, open for conversation. Thank you, Johnny, for the overview. So yeah, we will open it up for any questions or comments for Johnny on either the IMC language or the IRC language. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, my first question was kind of, yeah, around the, the makeup error requirement. I know there was some back and forth um, on the concerns with that. But did I hear you correctly? You're kind of leaving it at that 400 CFM exception. Yeah, right, right now we're leaving at 400. I think you know in the future um, it would be smart for us to start lowering that a little bit um, requirement. But right now we're keeping it at 400. If we were to lower it to like 300, then you know I think a makeup error it would, it would add like a thousand extra dollars <laughs> or something like that from what I was hearing. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that kind of segues to maybe my next kind of follow up question to that is on page eight for your construction cost, you, you kind of have a footnote there about if makeup error is triggered. And I was wondering what might trigger that. If you're going to install an intermittent um, range hood or um, downdraft exhaust system that had a max. Um, exhaust rate that's above 400 and i think that you can actually program the range to not go to their max so it's like basically you, they would just need to ensure that the intermittent range hoods are not um programmed to exceed 400 cfm eric is that correct <laughs> yeah so th this proposal is status quo at this point that we aren't it's not proposed to lower the 400 CFM threshold that's in the current code. Yeah, a lot of the range hood manufacturers are using EC motors and they have, you know, electronic settings that limit the maximum airflow to be under 400 CFM. Other manufacturers have fan uh, restriction kits that you can buy to limit the maximum CFM. But again, this is this would be status quo. We wouldn't be, I don't, we could really strike through that sentence because it, it's not proposed to go to change anything um, to, to start triggering makeup there unless someone on the tag chooses to try to modify this proposal today to, to lower that threshold. So. I mean, what, what we did try to add was awareness around the testing that if you're required to have makeup fair, that you have to have an automatic system. And if you are exempt from makeup fair, then you need to either test with the window manually opened or you can try to test with the window closed and see if you can achieve your minimum airflow. So there is some direction on the testing section now uh, to draw attention to, to this. Okay, so uh, Ian, did that answer all your questions? Uh, that answered my questions for now. Thank you. Okay, great. And then Eric, were you making a friendly suggestion to delete that sentence about makeup error so that it wasn't confusing anybody that that was part of the or is it just extra informative information? I, yeah, we might want to put an informative note or strike that through or something saying final proposal didn't lower. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what is. Johnny, how do you want to address that comment? We could say. Uh, proposal does not change from. Change makeup air requirements from 2018 Washington State. Sorry, we can just delete that line. I, I had it in, included in there previously when we started talking about lowering it to 300 CFM or 200 CFM. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I, I just put it in there, but we can delete it. 
it uh, we are we are not going to be triggering makeup error requirements from this. So. Okay, thanks. And Eric, you had your hand up. Did you have any other questions or comments? I I'd just like to thank Johnny for for going through this and walking through our whole code and checking all the cross references. Thanks for all the editorial pickups. It's always it's always good to have a new set of eyes that hasn't read everything before to read it. So that's very helpful. I think this is a good proposal to, to start moving forward, provide awareness. Again, there's a lot of education that needs to be happening in multifamily buildings, especially with how, how tight we're building these, constructing these uh, residences. And, uh, you know, it, it is a challenge to get this makeup air into projects. I, it, it's got a big cost associated. I talk to owners every day when we do a lot of multifamily construction owners and developers. And I, I tell them that, that they, you know, they, they need to tell occupants to open their window when running their dryer, their clothes dryer or their range hood. And, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of education that needs to happen. Some of them kind of cringe and I tell them we're, we're not building labs, we're building resonances. And, and so it's a, a different world, but, uh, um, anyways, I think this is a good step forward on, on providing better range exhaust systems, uh, for health and wellness and residential dwelling units, so. Thank you, Eric. Um, Valerie, you had your hand up, you just put it down. Did you have anything? Yeah, I just wanted to point out one thing. And in the IRC, makeup error isn't required unless you have a indirect gas appliance and 400 CFMs of exhaust. So makeup error isn't actually required in the IRC anymore unless you have those two triggers. So it's, it actually we might need makeup error eventually in residential, but it's not there anymore. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Ian, back to you. Yeah, I would like to go back to, I think you have some tables up above um, kind of showing availability or maybe it was below availability of different range hood products by a percentage yeah and you're providing the the cfm um, i was just wondering kind of that goes along with this is that three sewn rating and is that captured in these numbers of percentage available I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that question right off the top of my head. Um, I'm wondering if, um, Mike, you happen to know that off the top of your head, <laughs> Mike Moore? I, I don't, I know that I looked at the downdrafts and not the range hoods here, um, or sorry, not the OTRs in terms of zones. And every downdraft that's listed in the HBI directory um, at, with a working speed, um, rating has a has a sown value of three or less. So that's 100% of those. Um, I remember looking into that. And then as far as the OTRs go, um, I don't have the, the numbers there, but I do know that um, Randy Cooper, who was on the call last week or a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was, representing AHAM, he had mentioned that, uh, that the number that they could support was um, was 240 um, CFM based on avail product availability of OTRs, but that uh, 250 was was pretty close as well, and um, he didn't balk at that. So, um, just presuming to speak for Randy here, but um, I recall that he was okay with 250 as being really close to the 240 that they were looking for. Um, I'm I'm thank you, Mike. I'm jumping into the California case report that this analysis is from. I'm pretty sure that the answer is yes, because it says proposed requirements and part of those proposed requirements was the stone rating, but um, I'll verify that right now. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions, Ian? Um, no, no more questions. Um, it, it does seem like we're gonna get to a vote on this today. And as this, 
prior to that, I'd just like to provide a couple of our, our comments uh, when we get to that point. I don't know if now would be appropriate for that or if we want to take some other input on the proposal. Yeah, I don't see anyone else's hand up, so, so go for it, whatever other thoughts or comments you have. So yeah, my, my comments um, kind of going back to the previous meeting, we did have some experts come in, Randy Cooper from AHAM and uh, Ian Walker from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And um, one of the things I wanted to identify is that they stated that lab testing is still ongoing um, for, the, for these prescribed CFMs um, to see how effective this CFM is. Uh, at mitigating issues for gas and electric. And Ian Walker from Lawrence Berkeley also identified that electric ranges uh, frying also, when you're frying and, and that sort of thing does still put out some particulate matter that's in excess of limits. Um, it was also identified that the capture efficiency rating that was proposed is still not an official standard and is still under development. Um, also, Randy Cooper from AHAM also identified that there is ongoing lab testing and ASHRAE is taking a look at some of these standards and working towards developing a standard. Um, and then also, yeah, to kind of touch on some input that was brought up earlier about makeup air, you know, what impacts this is going to have on makeup air, especially on smaller dwelling units. Um, just overall trying to I guess identify that this CFM, you know, what what is the appropriate CFM? And I think we have some organizations that are working on this uh, with lab testings to prescribe a, a, a standard that works. And so I guess from my position, um, I would kind of like to see how that develops for the next code cycle uh, before voting on something like this. And those are my comments. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate that. Um, Nancy, go ahead. Um, I'd just like to, I've been following this research um, for a number of years now, and I think it's pretty solid. We know the nitric oxides from the gas burning have caused a lot of health problems. And we know we need to exhaust them. There's always going to be ongoing research. It doesn't mean that this isn't a problem that should be addressed sooner rather than later. I have been worried since I started this job almost 20 years ago with the lack of requirements for exhaust ventilation from kitchens. Um, and the research is just piling up in terms of the need. I think there's been a huge amount of work by people to make this a reasonable presentation and I would much prefer to move forward with it now then um, wait a few more years. And um, when we're ready, I will move the proposal to, um, I will move acceptance of the proposal. <laughs> I think that's the wording. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, before we get there, any other thoughts, comments, edits? I can respond to a few things Ian said. Um, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So you know, we we have the capture efficiency here as it doesn't require anybody to use the capture efficiency route. We actually are just making the proposal more flexible. So, um, you know, as the capture efficiency is team standard is refined and, and that information is more available, it could actually increase the, you know, it could lower the CFM rates for the needed range hoods. Um, so. You know, I think we're going to keep it there for added flexibility. Um, kind of building on what Nancy said, you know, again, there's always research happening. Um, this is actually going to be increasing the ventilation rate for electric stoves too, because of that exact PM 2.5 reason. Um, but both electric and combustion ranges produce PM 2.5, but only combustion ranges produce NOx in the levels that are are dangerous and and we need higher ventilation rates to take care of the NOx. The 160 CFM rate for the electric stove is enough to take care of the PM 2.5, but the uh, it it's not enough to take care of the NOx for 
the combustion ranges. Um, I tried to be fair and, and, and kind of reasonable when, when doing this proposal, you know, um, I know I pre prefer, I preferably would have gone with the 280 because it would have been more conservative and, and it would have been, um, been better for the health potentially of, of, of future occupants for smaller homes. But I heard enough feedback from, you know, industry groups and from concerned people that 280 was too high. So I, I dropped it to 250 to, to kind of, you know, try to be as reasonable as we could, as well as I heard concerns about the makeup air requirements and, and I didn't want to cause it, have this be an, too much of a cost burden for folks. I'm, I'm hoping that this will incentivize people to move towards healthier cooking stoves um, and, and installing range hoods that, in, that are going to increase the rates that will actually reduce pollutants inside homes. Um, yeah, and uh, I looked more into the product availability um, with the sewn rating. My assumption is that the this table is talking about sewn. It doesn't specifically say that in the study, so I would have to email to get further verification, but I don't think that it will be an issue because it when they were doing the proposed requirements, um, they like we're looking at a bunch of different they're they're saying these are all the criteria of 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 making sure that these range hoods are actually meeting proposed requirements. So I'm pretty sure it also includes sound. Thanks, Johnny. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, edits on either the IMC or IRC proposal? All right, uh, seeing none, I think we are looking for a motion for both proposals 62 and 63. I'll move approval or acceptance of 62 and 63. Thanks, Nancy. Is there a second? So just to recap, we are, there is a motion on the floor to move approval of proposals 62 and 63. So looking for a second on that. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. Well, I am confused. I've only heard um, one other person raise concerns. Um, I've heard a, a, quite a bit of discussion over the ins and outs. If nobody's willing to make a second, what are their, are they gonna raise their concerns? I guess I'm not even sure how many are voting members. Yeah, I think um, we have six members of the tag here today. Um, let's see, uh, Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, last time I kind of spoke on where we stand on this and um, even with the changes, I'm not changing that stance. I think it should be more of a national um, push. So um, I haven't chimed in yet. So that's just kind of my reasoning. Thanks, Andrea. Any other members of the TAG have thoughts or comments or would like to second this motion? Um, so, uh, Valerie, go ahead. Yeah, my concern about this is the definition of enclosed um, kitchens and how kitchens aren't enclosed anymore. So it's actually gonna force everybody to have a hood over their stove and it's kind of a big expense to have to require a hood over every stove. I don't know how many kitchens are actually enclosed anymore. And then the definition that you give a square footage, a low income housing 
even if they have three walls around it, they might not have that opening size. So it's kind of, um, I don't know about adding that definition for enclosed kitchens or not. That was my concern. Okay, uh, Johnny, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, if if people aren't installing enclosed, you know, the, if they they can not enclose their kitchen, but they have to install an intermittent exhaust hood um, at that point. If you don't have an enclosed kitchen, then you basically have you know an open floor space with the kitchen attached to a living room, and having continuous exhaust system is kind of meaningless at that point because the volume of the air is so large that it no longer. Um, is doing what it's intent to do, which is to remove pollutants from the space. So, um, well, in a 300 square foot apartment, some of these apartments you can literally touch the stove from the bed, and you're going to require them to install a kitchen hood, exhausted to outside. This proposal would require that. Eric. Yeah, I guess. What we typically see, we've done a lot of multifamily housing, um, everything from low income to, you know, high end apartments, I would say 95% of them are using ducted range hoods right now. We've done one project, which is a low income housing project in Seattle that went passive house that used recirculating range hoods. Um, Again, you, you're still required to have a recirculating range hood above the appliance, so all you're saving is, uh, or a recirculating microwave above, above the, the range. Um, so you're just saving a little bit of ductwork and a wall penetration, so it's pretty minimal cost as far as that, because you already have to have the hood. And most of the hoods are convertible from being recirculated to ducted already so again you'll have to have a larger range hood if you're going uh natural gas but low-income housing typically isn't doing uh natural gas ranges they're typically electric ranges so i would say you know of, of the 500 residential projects that i've been a part of in the last 10 years you know very few of them are using recirculating range hoods currently. It's been our experience in the market right now. So. And I, I tried to estimate what the cost would be for what Eric's talking about with the extra duct work, assuming that they have to install, already have to install a recirculating range hood anyway. And it ended up being like $200 and $57 for the extra duct work in the penetration. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Eric. Um, let's go to Nancy. I guess I'm just really concerned with the concept that that low income people and in smaller facilities are supposed to breathe a lot more exhaust. This is when our health problem, the research is is huge in this area um, and the health impacts are huge. And I, you know, there's a might be a little more upfront cost, but in the long run, there's a huge saving in terms of health. So I don't think that low income should mean that you stew in your own um, fumes. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Mike, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to second Eric's um, observation there about the uh, um, the multifamily. Um, applications and especially low income that uh, if you're low income, you're probably putting in an electric um, range and then the requirement would be for 160 CFM. And if you got a hood already, then it's just um, a very small cost associated with, especially when you look at the health benefits associated with this measure, the, uh, the termination and perhaps a little bit of extra ducting required to, um, to get that out because you're already having to provide exhaust in the, in the kitchen for these dwelling units. So it's just about hooking up that um, range hood at that point. And the 160 CFM is, is basically the, the lowest end of, um, of hoods that are certified in the HVI database um, to be able to reach that on high speed. So it's, um, it's not a 
a huge cost based on the, the benefit that we could expect to see here. Thank you, Mike. All right, um, would anybody, hopefully that helped um, answer some questions or concerns, I guess, with that additional information, would anybody like to second Nancy's motion? I will second the motion to pass this code change. Thank you, Valerie. Any further discussion? All right, um, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Nancy. Aye. Valerie. Aye. Jonathan. I'm gonna to try to abstain if that's possible. Chris. No. Andrea. No. Brandon. No. Brandon, are you there? I'm oh, sorry, I don't know. Okay, motion failed three to two with one abstention, or two to three with one abstention. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. Moving on, uh, Eric, go ahead. Is there a way to get the editorial changes in here, move forward? Just the corrections to table references and such? Correct. Yeah, I'll catch those as just editorial. Okay. And then uh, uh, what are the options as far as taking this to the PAG? I guess there, there's options for both the majority and minority report on this proposal going to the MBE committee. <clears throat> yes, I think um, it will definitely go to the MBE committee. And Krista, is there an official majority or minority report that needs to be created? Uh, typically, it's just a position paper that is submitted to the council. Okay. And I guess I want to be clear that this is this is no for both the IMC and the IRC, or is there a difference? Would would that make a difference to any tag members? That's a good question. I guess would any tag member like to make a comment about? whether they would change their vote if it only applied to the IMC or to the IRC. I would not. Likewise. Okay, Brandon, Andrea. Chris, would that change your view at all if it was for one code or the other? No, it would be the same. Okay. Okay, um, let's move along to our last proposal. So this is proposal eight and nine by Mike uh, LeBliner. I think being represented today by Jonathan, if that's correct. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think, did we by chance get that one that I submitted to you, uh, you and Eric in here, or is that something I would possibly have to reshare for the omitted language? Um, I think Krista might have extracted that from that email or a version of it. And that is, uh, I think, what she has on the screen here. But we can take a close look at it. So on the left side is the IMC version, and on the right side is the IRC version. 
Yeah, sorry, ROC isn't quite fitting at the moment. So Jonathan, you want to walk us through um, some of the questions and comments that were raised and how this new proposal addresses those. Yeah, um, I did my best to keep into the email conversations that were going back and forth on the on the worth group, and it, and it sounds like um, the exceptions for the residential groups that we were looking for um, to ensure industry integrities was all taken care of with this new language as proposed back and forth from from the the work group. Um, Again, it does offer an alternative ASHRAE standard, but it does now that this section has been moved to the 403.4, which is the Group R whole house mechanical ventilation section. So this way it directly affects the whole house mechanical ventilation section uh, more so than the whole code, which was a concern before. Um, yeah, and so I think this I think this proposal addresses most of the new concerns. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Jonathan? Eric, go ahead. So again, I, I think this is a challenge for code enforcement throughout the state. Um, so I'm, I would not recommend moving forward with this. Um, I like having more of a prescriptive code that's easier to enforce across the state. Um, I did help develop some enforceable code language here um, that, that would limit this to just group R dwelling units. So it's not gonna cover you know, group R sleeping units where you have to go back to other uh, provisions of the code. So I do like how it was uh, limited. Um, so if, if the tag is gonna move forward with the flexibility to, to design to 62.2, uh, a national standard, not a code. Um, I think this is enforceable code language. Uh, it does make the distinction that um, you know the commercial buildings have systems have to be designed. Buildings under the commercial energy code have to be designed by a registered design professional. Um, so. Uh, Anyways, I think the tag should carefully consider if all buildings should be designed by a re registered design professional. Um, and then how we're going to, you know, support this with education of code officials throughout the state of Washington. Um, so, uh, again, there's no cost impact noted in, in the proposal in regards to um, you know, costs for code officials to learn another standard uh, in addition to our code. So while that standard is available for free read only online, um, it still is a burden to the code officials for the 150 cities and counties across the state. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Jonathan, did you want to respond to any of that? Uh, you know, as far as code official enforcement keeps being brought up, um, I'm involved with with a lot of jurisdictional um, help, so to speak, as our position as uh, you know energy code support for the state of Washington. And uh, it is a new standard to learn. I, I won't disagree with that, but do I think it's any more difficult than all the stuff that they already have to learn to begin with? And and I don't. Um, and, and imagine, remember too, this is this is an exception. So if people wish to use this, then they are going down that path to do so. This is not a requirement by any means. Actually, you made an exception so they can use it. You don't get, you don't, if you make something an exception, then somebody can actually pick that exception and use it. Absolutely, but it's not so a requirement. It, yeah, it's an exception that doesn't require permission from the HJ to use. So exactly. Use it. And I guess that's kind of one of my questions is if the benefit of this is if you use this alternate, it will result in more ventilation being required, which would be larger systems. So why, what is preventing anyone from choosing to just design to a higher ventilation rate? So I, 
it begs the question of why, why does this need to be in code? I, I think, um, I mean, I have some other comments on potential collisions created in requirements between 62.2 and our current whole house section. Um, but yeah, just putting that aside, the logic of, you know, it'd be like in energy code having alternates for other green building certifications or I don't know, there's, if it's not mandatory, like I would understand if Mike's proposal had been to require increased ventilation rates in R2, three stories or less, I think that would be a much different conversation. But given that it's an option, it seems the potential harm, which is this burden on code officials potentially, again, outweighs the benefit when more ventilation is a choice that could be made by any builder. So, well, this also aligns to modeling procedures that are being used to comply with state per state requirements as well, right? We often reference um, ASHRAE standards in, in a lot of modeling procedures, particularly the ERI has a very specific version of, of ASHRAE it references for its ventilation standards. So I, I get the issue that you say there may be some more educa education and training that, that may be required. I can respect that, but I do believe in the, the flip side. Again, this is, this is an option. And then in the end, it seems like it's going to be a more rigorous option than, than the prescriptive for the individual to use it. And I am not an expert on 90, I believe 90.1, which is commercial whole building modeling. But there's a lot of engineers in here. And uh, does ASHRAE also apply to the 90.1 modeling, which is the commercial procedure, right? Am I mixing those up, 90.1 and 90.2 ASHRAE modeling procedures? For energy modeling, yeah, 90.1 Appendix G, but the ventilation in those projects would be designed per IMC. Nice. And in a lot of the cases too, the Energy Star program uses this as well. Um, they do default to whichever is more stringent by the local code. Um, but default by but by default, if you're looking at the new ERI uh, Energy Star multifamily high rise specification for modeling, um, it also uses an ASHRAE standard for ventilation. Caroline, I guess go back to your earlier question. Yes, the energy code does not prohibit overventilation in residences. So yes, the ventilation rates are just minimums in the mechanical code. Yeah, I think just some of the other potential um, collisions between 62.2 and the current IMC could just cause confusion. So that is that is my thought. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Well, I'm trying to raise my hand. Thanks, Nancy, go ahead. <laughs> my button didn't want to work. Okay, can someone explain to me before we finish this, why Mike thinks that if this isn't passed, um, oh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out, summarize what he said here. Okay, that if the ASHRAE rate option does not go through, then low rise multifamily units will be underventilated and occupants exposed to more IAQ pollutants of concern. I know this has been an issue, Mike has been, um, very concerned about. I watched his video a long time ago and seen um, Dr. Ian Wallet's materials. But their concern is the existing code is allowing underventilation of multifamily units. Yeah, this proposal will not fix the problem Mike articulates because it is not mandatorily requiring increased ventilation. It is saying that if you want, you can provide more ventilation. But right now, if you want, you can provide more ventilation. Correct. Right now you could apply our code and 
and bump up the ventilation rates to be above the minimum, right? There's no, there's no maximum ventilation rate for residential in, in the energy code. We have an exceptions. We have exceptions in the energy code saying that you, you're not limited by the 150% cap for ventilation. Um, so you can double the numbers, triple the numbers, whatever you want to do um, using our methodology and our code that we have. So folks aren't going to be motivated to go to a code that requires higher ventilation typically because it's going to end up costing more. Well, yeah, that's the rub. We were trying to get people to increase ventilation, period, due to health issues. Um, so that's a different code proposal. That's like proposing the, the, the table we adopted in 2018, but the rates are too low and they need to increase. You know? I'm kind of hoping Ashley comes to that. Well, all their guidance, I just read their new guidance um, last night, but it was too late for me to really get my head around um, how much impact their new guidance is going to have in terms of their actual standards. Um, so do most multifamily, low rise multifamily units allow windows? I mean, these people can still open windows, right? Yeah, most multi most multifamily residences have windows. I would say operable windows, correct. And when you get these high rise apartment buildings right next to the freeway, which is ridiculous from a health perspective, but that's what I see in in um, on the east side. Do they also have windows that open? I would yes. say mo most most high rises have operable windows. There are some out there that don't. And they have to be 10 feet away from the road. <laughs> I'm sorry, Valerie. <laughs> I think the standard should be 500 feet. California. Well, that, that's a planning. That's what your planning group and land use department has to do for you. We can't <laughs> do that here. I know. California's had that standard for schools since 2003. Um, I, I despair sometimes of, of how to make a difference with some of these things because we don't have their pipeline of research from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and CARB to code. Okay, I think you've answered my questions about this as best as I can understand it. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Mike, you put something in the chat. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, yeah, the 2024 IMC has been updated to align the ventilation rates with ASHRAE 622. So if you guys are looking to address, you know, that in particular um, and ensure that the, uh, the ventilation rates are more commensurate with what 622 requires, you can just skip the 622 reference and then just um, modify the, uh, the floor rate coefficient for the ventilation um, rate equation to be from 0 0.1 to um, to be from 0 0.01 to 0 0.03, and that should probably do what uh, what I'm hearing you guys wanting to to do here, um, unless I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, thanks for that suggestion, Mike. I don't know if the current um, cost benefit analysis and just the way this proposal was set up is, is available to do that. Um, Jonathan, did you want to respond? Yeah, one of the concerns was the requirement that ERVs and multifamily low rise as well. Um, you know, currently we're having an argument in the energy code over um, COPs because we can't use them in the residential code. Uh, so which by proxy eliminates a lot of shared systems. So multifamily um, low rises, as, as, as uh, Mike likes to put it, or three stories is less, um, typically isn't the same cat as those that are above. And, and they need some special considerations sometimes just because the differences in the codes. And this was looking for that. This was looking for, while it also required balanced ventilation, it did not require an ERV installed in every single unit. So that's already been addressed through action on by this committee on another proposal, though. So that that issue is no longer germane to this 
proposal, I don't think, because you already, the committee has already clarified that the IMC did not mean to require H or ERVs for low rise R2s. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's correct, Jonathan. The proposal that we looked at a couple of weeks ago already addressed um, the issue that you just brought up. Um, so is there, I guess, Jonathan, did you have thoughts on Mike's suggestion about airflow rates or is that not where you wanna head with this? No, I haven't had a chance to review the 2024 code other than a national proposal for an HVAC requirement for air handlers themselves. Other than that, I really haven't deep dived into the 2024. Um, I would like to take a look at it before we just accepted it in, in, in the spirit of Libby's proposal. Okay. And then um, I had a question about the language on the screen. Was the intent that in the IMC, this did in fact just apply to group R dwelling units in uh, three stories or less, I think as this is written right now, it would apply to, to all systems. And I wasn't clear if Mike's intent was to have it only apply to those low rise buildings. Hmm. It is a good question. I know in particularly from my perspective and my experiences with the code hotline, I am definitely more concerned with low rise than the high rise, but um, I honestly couldn't speak on behalf of Mike's. And that's only because I don't receive any phone calls for anything above three stories. That would be Lisa Resino with Evergreen Technologies. Yeah, I guess, um, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, the IRC just applies to single family homes and townhouses mostly, right? So it should just say, I don't know. You well, can just well, get, rid of, get rid of everything and just, so you can get rid of two residential building provisions. Yeah, all the way through dwelling units, right? Just remove that part of it subject to or get rid of subjects exhaust systems uh, yeah yeah get rid of subject to just say local exhaust system yeah exhaust systems designed and commissioned in accordance with that and so that's all you would need i think that would apply to everything in irc then Right, and then on the left, Eric, I guess I was thinking, um, of limiting it to group R, three stories or less. So I guess item two, exception two, which would apply to buildings subject to the commercial energy code. Yeah, I was trying not to reference three stories or less just because of the central systems versus unit by unit. So if it's a central system, it's then should be designed by a registered design professional. It should not, it shouldn't have to be. Whereas if it was unit by unit, then it's more permissible to not design to it be designed by a registered design professional, so. Yeah, I mean, if it suits the group, um, again, I, I can't speak for a commercial because I don't get those phone calls. And I think that my predecessor would have more information on that. So I apologize for that, for being the new guy. Um, so definitely my concern and expertise is definitely the, the three stories or less residential designated properties. And if we believe we can handle that in the IRC amendment and not in the mechanical amendment on the left, I am completely down for striking language all the way out except for the IRC. Does that make sense? Would that simplify the issues that we have here? Eric, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. 
Sorry, I think I just left my hand up there. So, um, I don't know. I think I think we can. So, I guess what are we trying to fix in the? Well, I guess I'm just. I and now that we think about it, like exception two is also allowing the use of sixty two dot two for R two four stories or more that would comply with the commercial energy code. Correct. And I'm just curious why would if if Mike's concern was about are two, three stories or less, and if we're trying to limit the burden on code officials, would that limit the number of projects that can use this alternate if we limit it to low-rise buildings, limit the use of the alternate to low-rise buildings, I guess. That's what yeah, that would, yeah, so that. And, and I believe the delivery of ERV type technologies in four stories and above is, is a bit simpler is my understanding because you do have different metrics in which um, to use for selecting equipment than we do in the residential process. So I guess before we potentially take action on this, Jonathan, are you amenable to striking exception two so that that would mean that this exception is only available to projects um, complying with the residential energy code. I am in the honor of seven highly habits of effective people. I am down for any win-win I can achieve today. Um, Valerie, go ahead. Well, in the IBC, there is no such thing as a residential building. They're all commercial buildings with our occupancies within them. So there isn't a definite, there's no such thing as a residential building under the IBC or IMC. They're all commercial buildings. And a high rise building is 75 feet or higher. I don't know what the definition of a low rise building is. So it's a uh, you'd have to put more definitions in around that. But there is no such thing as a residential building in the IBC. It's a commercial building with R occupancies, S, A in them. They have multiple, multiple different types of occupancies within them. Public corridor. Well, residential buildings is meant to, in this case, refer to the energy code de de definition. So the residential buildings provision, not the commercial buildings provisions of the, the energy code. Those are defined terms in the energy code. Yeah, but they're not defined in the IBC or IMC. But the exception reference the state energy code. Yeah, I mean, we use that same language other places in the mechanical okay. code, so. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Um, let's see, Valerie, your hand's still up. Did you have any other thoughts there? Okay. All right, seeing no other comments or hands up, would anyone like to make a motion on proposal eight and nine? We want two separate motions on this one, just to be clear. Sure. Um, let's do the IMC first. So looking for a motion on proposal number nine. Is that something that I can propose out there to start the ball rolling just out of curiosity? I'm not so up on my my, my rule of rubrics here. Yes, any tag member can make a motion of any kind to approve or disapprove. We can't make motions to table today. This is our last meeting. Okay, so I would make a motion to approve it as amended. I'll second. All right, any further discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote on proposal nine.
Nancy. Yes. Valerie. Nay. Jonathan. Aye. Aye. Chris. Yes. Andrea. Yeah. That was a nay. Abstain, sorry. Abstain. Brandon. Yes. Motion carries four to one with one abstention. Okay. Um, moving on to proposal eight for the IRC. Would anyone like to make a motion? So I'll make a motion to approve it as amended. Thanks, John. <coughs> I'll second. Thanks, Nancy. Any further discussion? Okay. It's, sorry. Go ahead, Krista. Oh, roll call. Nancy? Yes. Valerie? Nay. Jonathan? Yes. Chris? Yes. Andrea? No. Brandon? Yes. Motion carries four to two. And I would like to, to vocalize, thank you for everyone's patience with this swap over. I couldn't keep up with everything. So I really do appreciate, appreciate your patience and your help with me through this process this time. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, all right, we have made it through all of our proposals. Um, we do not have any additional business unless anybody on the tag has any other motions or amendments or anything you would like to address for any of the work that we've completed over the last four weeks. Give everybody just a minute or two to think about that. Um, Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for running effective meetings and Krista for being really responsive and um, setting out stuff ahead of time. So I just appreciate your work, so thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you for participating. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, all right. Well, thank you all um, for showing up, for participating, being part of the process, making great codes for Washington. Really appreciate everybody's contributions. Um, and yeah, don't hesitate to participate in any part of the process moving forward. Um, you are all welcome to submit public comment on anything and um, yeah, can't express enough. Thank you to everybody here. So with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks, nice work. Thank you.